Hello, everyone. Welcome to the breakout session on Privacy is Power. I have Vesta Marks. I'm a portfolio manager on William Blair's fixed income investment management team. It is my honor to introduce our speaker today and serve as the moderator for the discussion. Carissa Veliz is a renowned author and reputable voice on the topics of personal data, privacy, digital ethics, and political philosophy. Her work spans both the academic and public policy domains. Ms. Veliz is an associate professor at the Faculty of Philosophy and Institute for Ethics and AI, as well as a tutorial fellow at Hartford College of the University of Oxford. She has been a consultant to the Spanish government, an advisory member for the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and a key witness to the Communications and Digital Committee of the United Kingdom's House of Lords. I would like to please note that we have time for questions and answers at the end, so please feel free to use the Zoom messaging feature at the bottom of your window to post questions during the session, and we will aim to get to them during the Q&A part. So without further ado, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Carissa Veliz to share her remarks with us. Thank you so much, Vesta. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for coming to this session. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the relationship between privacy and geopolitics today, and in particular, how privacy and power um, relate to one another. And just to start the discussion, just to motivate the discussion, I want to start with a story about how personal data has been misused in the past. Because many times when we talk about data, it's very abstract, it's very invisible. Um, we have gotten used to thinking about data as a currency, as kind of something like oil, and that makes it a little bit removed from our everyday experience. Uh, so I will talk about uh, for about 35 minutes to leave plenty of time for questions. And I would really like to know um, what you are interested in, what you're worried about, and to have more of an interaction. One of the first things that the Nazis did when they invaded a city was go to the registry because that's where the data was held. And they wanted to find out where the Jews were. And there's a study that compares the country in Europe that had the most data on its citizens, which was the Netherlands, versus a country in Europe that had the least data on its citizens, which was France. Now in the Netherlands, there was this a man called Lenz, who had designed a system that would track people from cradle to grave. And he was a pioneer in population statistics. He was the developer of the ID card. And the result was that the Dutch had a lot of, of, of information about their citizens, including things like religious affiliation, but also things like where your grandparents lived. Now, in contrast, in France, the government had made a conscious decision not to collect certain kinds of data because they were too sensitive. And in 1872, they stopped collecting data about religious affiliation. So when the Nazis invaded France, the French could say, we have no idea how many Jewish people live here, let alone where they live. So you're on your own. And the result was that in the Netherlands, the Nazis found about 73% of the Jewish population and assassinated them. And in France, 25% of the Jewish population. And the difference is in the hundreds of thousands of people. So just to take one example out of that history to illustrate the kind of danger that we're dealing with. Um, in 1943, there was a resistance cell in Amsterdam that realized how dangerous the registry was. So they decided to try to destroy the records. They went into the building, they sed sedated the guards, and they set fire to the documents. And they had some sympathizers within the fire department. And the deal was that the fire department would arrive late and that they would use more water than necessary so that they could destroy as many records as possible. Unfortunately, they were incredibly unsuccessful. They only managed to destroy about 15% of the records. They got found out and killed. And 70,000 Jews got found in Amsterdam. And the Dutch had made two mistakes. The first mistake was that they were collecting much more data than necessary. And the second mistake was that they didn't have any easy way to delete that data quickly in the event of an emergency. And we are making both those mistakes at a grand scale, like never before in history. And that should make us think twice. When I started um, researching about privacy, I, I read a lot of books about privacy and the law, I read a lot of books about privacy and computer science, but nobody was talking about why is privacy so important? There's a reason why privacy is part of the Declaration of Human Rights. 
the people who designed these rights and who, who drafted this declaration had just come from a very traumatic experience after the Second World War, and they were, they were worried about the most important things for society. And lately, we have had this narrative, especially from big tech companies, but also from, from other places, that privacy is something um, like a personal preference, that if you are not a criminal, you have nothing to hide, and you're not very shy, then there's no reason for you to take care of your data. And if that's true, if, if privacy is just a preference, does that mean that the people who drafted the Declaration of Human Rights were just totally clueless? Or are we clueless and are we missing something important there? So I started thinking about how data amounts to money. And in particular, personal data is very profitable. And at that time, this was like seven years ago, there wasn't so much consciousness about that in, in the citizenry. Now I think if you ask anyone um, down the street, why does an X company collect your data? They will say something like, well, they profit from it and they show me personalized ads. That much we've understood. But I think the relationship between data and politics goes a lot deeper than that. And even more important than being profitable, personal data bestows power upon those who have it. And we haven't thought that thought through enough how, how, how important power is and how it can create asymmetries that distort democracy and that end up being bad for society. When I was researching this topic, I, I came across an analogy that I really liked from the philosopher Bertrand Russell. And he argues that we should think about power like a kind of energy. And one of the characteristics of energy is that it can transform itself from one thing into another. So if you have enough political power, you can get economic power. If you have enough economic power, you can get military power. If you have enough military power, you get political power and so on. And we're very familiar with these three kinds of power. These are like the classic kinds of power that have been there forever. And um, we understand pretty well. But there's this other kind of power that has always been there. It was kind of dormant in, in a way, or its importance was a lot um, less because we didn't have the tools to really enhance it. And this kind of power has to do with the ability to forecast, with the ability to predict what people are going to do next. And importantly, try to influence that and have a different outcome than would otherwise have been possible. And this kind of power is incredibly important in the digital age. And it kind of snuck up on us because we had certain litmus tests in society to know like when a certain company had too much power and that litmus test failed because we hadn't understood this very important relationship between data and power. The litmus test was that if a company is able to um, really increase their prices without losing any customers, then that's a kind of symptom that it might be a monopoly and we should research. But of course, some of the companies that um, we're familiar with today are technically free, or so they have claimed. And so the litmus test failed. And of course, what we should have had in place is a more general principle of when a company um, imposes exploitative practices on their customers or users, whether it be the amount of money you pay or the amount of data you have to give up without losing any customers, that is a symptom that maybe we should research that company. But of course, we didn't have that idea. And we arguably, we still haven't developed that or we are in, in, in the process of developing that. So I went back into the philosophy of power and knowledge and studied um, what other thinkers had said about that. And of course, um, thinkers like Francis Bacon had already thought about this and he argued that the more power you have, sorry, the more knowledge you have, the more power you have over people. And generally, the more you, you know about your environment, the more you're likely to be able to have an effect on that environment and to be able to, to get what you want out of that environment. And then someone like Michel Foucault argued that the contrary is also true. The more power you have, the more you get to decide what counts as knowledge. And I think this insight is particularly important in, in today's context. So for instance, when a big tech company is so big that they have lots of power, they also get to decide what counts as knowledge about us. They get to categorize us. And categorizing is an act of power. It determines who is going to win and who is going to lose in a certain transaction. And it, depend, it, it determines how we're gonna be treated. 
And one of the effects that the data economy is having is that it is seriously undermining equality of opportunity. So say you and I are neighbors and we are not being treated as equal citizens. You are not being treated as an equal citizen to your neighbor. You're being treated on the basis of your data. So whether you are a man or a woman, black or white, rich or poor, whether you drive one kind of car or another, whether you have diabetes or not, you are going to be offered a different price for certain services. You are going to wait longer or shorter in line. You are going to see different opportunities online. So the kind of, say, job advertisements you get are going to be different. And this is eroding um, the kind of social fabric of society that is necessary to have a healthy democracy. But this is more kind of a national concern. But data has a huge influence in geopolitics today. And I, will, I, I, I would argue that data is going to be the crucial element in geopolitics, because it does not only have to do with trade, which it does, but it also has to do with intelligence. And it also has to do, uh, of course, with money, and it has to do with AI and with all sorts of, of other facets that are um, in play right now uh, in the international sphere. But along with data being very dangerous in that sense, because it gives a lot of power to those who have it, data also has a double edge. Personal data is a toxic asset. And that doesn't mean that we can't use it or we shouldn't um, profit from it. It means that we have to use it very, very carefully, just as if we were dealing with a, with a different kind of toxic substance. So the analogy I use here is asbestos. Asbestos is a mineral that is incredibly cheap, it's very easy to mine, and it's super useful because it doesn't catch fire easily and it's extremely durable. So we put this mineral everywhere. We put it in our plumbing, in our walls, in our tiles, in our cars, and it turns out that it's incredibly toxic. And every year, hundreds of thousands of people die from cancer caused by asbestos even in countries in which it's banned, because it's already in the kind of structure of buildings and, and other objects. So in the same way, personal data is very cheap, it's very easy to mine, and it's very useful sometimes, but it's also incredibly toxic. And it's poisoning society in three ways. It's poisoning individuals, it's poisoning companies, and it's poisoning the commons in the sense of like the public. So how is it poisoning individuals? It's poisoning individuals by exposing us to certain kinds of harms, which include discrimination, which I've already mentioned, things like extortion. So it's becoming more and more common that something like a, like a clinic, last case I read about was a clinic in Finland, a psychology clinic that got hacked and hackers got access to, you can imagine, incredibly sensitive documents and they extorted people. They said, if you don't give X amount of Bitcoin, we'll just release um, this very, very sensitive information. But we're also getting exposed to uh, foreign agents. And it's very concerning how much, to what extent we get exposed to them. So there are foreign agents, whether they be Russians, North Koreans, Chinese, or someone else, who have an interest in the citizens, say, of the United States, not having a lot of trust in their democracy, not having a lot of trust in each other. And they use personal data to target personalized propaganda in very, very toxic ways. So that's individuals. But companies are also um, getting poisoned by personal data. Every time a company collects data that is unnecessary, they are creating their own risk. It's a potential liability, it's a potential lawsuit, a potential hack or leak. And it's like holding um, a ticking bomb. Sooner or later, it's gonna go bad because personal data is so sensitive and so valuable that so many people want it. Other companies want it, criminals want it, uh, other governments want it. And as you know, in cyberspace, the attacker has an advantage over the defender because the defender has to defend themselves all the time against every possible attack. And the attacker, if they have enough resources, enough motivation, enough time, sooner or later, they'll get to that data. So 
the kind of system that we have now, the data economy, in which we're all trying to acquire as much personal data as possible through very qu questionable means, and then storing it for as long as possible is the most reckless thing we could do right now in a context in which democracy is not at its best moment, and we have rivals that in are incredibly good at hacking. So 50 years ago, Nazis had to actually, more than 50 years ago, um, use boots on the ground and get to that data. They had to invade a country. But today you need only a, a very small group of very good hackers and you could seriously injure a country. Just to give you an example, because this might sound a little bit abstract. Um, for instance, in 2019, the New York Times um, published a report in which two reporters who described themselves as not tech savvy at all, got a hold of data from a data broker and anybody could buy this data. And this data was location data from mobile phones. And within a few minutes, they managed to locate the president of the United States. And the way they did this is by correlating the public agenda of the president with a phone that was always there that turned out to be uh, from the secret service agent, from one secret service agent. And if the president of the United States is not safe, nobody is in the country and nobody around the world is. They also managed to identify very important lawyers and their clients and very important people in the military, other public officials. So what we're doing is truly, truly reckless. And companies um, that depend on the exploitation of personal data are betting on a business model that has an expiry date because this business model is just too toxic for society. It's unsustainable. And if they don't have anything else, if, they, if that's their, the way to earn their keep mainly, they are very, very vulnerable. So that's individuals, that's companies, and these um, personal data is also poisoning societies. It's poisoning societies by being um, a threat to national security, like we've already talked about. But, but another example is how we've built the internet to be very insecure, mostly so we can easily collect this data. But what that means is that uh, it's very easy to hurt a society. So one example is if hackers just hack 10% of our electrical appliances, all those washing machines that connect to the internet, air cons, and they turn them on at the same time, just 10%, they can bring down the national grid. Imagine in the context of a pandemic and being in lockdown and having your national grid down. And this is not, not hypothetical. There, there have been attacks to the national grid, for instance, in the UK during the pandemic. Thankfully, they were unsuccessful, but it's a matter of time until we have a massive cyber attack and we're not doing what it takes to protect us from that. Um, of course, all the other kinds of um, concerns include um, the security of nuclear power and so on and so forth. And, and part of all that, those concerns is because we don't have minimum cybersecurity standards. And part of why we don't have minimum cybersecurity standards is because we've been focusing on trying to get as much data as possible, which makes the internet very, very unsafe. But it's also harming countries in, in, in the way that, um, that equality is being eroded. Democracy is, is a, in danger. Perhaps the, the biggest example or the most clearest example is Cambridge Analytica and how it used data for personalized propaganda that was very, very harmful because it wasn't only propaganda about, you know, vote for this guy this, or, or, or for this candidate. It was personalized propaganda to convince people not to vote. And that is a, a direct attack on democracy. And now you can, you can argue, well, Cambridge Analytica is gone and it is gone, but there are about 300 firms that do pretty much the same thing. And we don't have adequate regulation to deal with that. So it's kind of astonishing that today, pretty much anyone can design an algorithm to do almost anything they want, and there's no kind of supervision. And furthermore, um, you wouldn't even know that your data is being used for that. We need to change that. Now, one of the most interesting things that have happened um, recently, that you may have heard about this in your last um, session, I don't know, I know there was a session on China, was that China has very recently passed one of the strictest privacy laws in the world. 
And this has been pretty astonishing to many, many people for a few reasons. One is that this immediately hurt its stock market. So people wonder like, why would China do that to itself? And very relevantly for a long time, um, there have been tech companies that have argued that we shouldn't regulate them because if we do, China will have the advantage and China will win the AI arms race. And this, is, this obviously is a very powerful argument uh, in this context. And now that argument doesn't hold anymore because China has regulated its tech companies. Of course, um, just to be clear, nobody expects China to stop surveilling its citizens. This law is not applicable to the government, but it does limit much of the personal data that companies have uh, been used to collecting up until now. So why did China do this to itself? Of course, this is speculation, but one very plausible reason is because they realized how big of a national security threat this is. All that data is data that sooner or later, if not already, the West was going to hack. And in the same way, we have seen that um, we have suffered very serious hacks recently, like the solar winds hack. Um, but sometimes we shouldn't underestimate how much how valuable personal data can be for national security. So for instance, China has been well known to try to recruit spies through LinkedIn. And of course, the more personal data you have on someone, the more likely it is that you'll be able to uh, blackmail them or to offer them exactly what they need at the right time. So it's a, it's a big concern. And at the moment, the US could do so much to change that state of affairs. Really, the, the, the ball is in the courts of the United States at the moment. So there are a couple of things that are front and center for the next few decades. What we do now regarding privacy will determine how our society works for decades to come, how companies earn their keep, what kind of powers the government has, how elections um, turn out. It's really crucial. So the first thing is that the US needs a privacy law urgently, a federal privacy law. And now that China has passed its privacy law, it put us a lot of pressure on the US because it's essentially one of the last con co developed countries uh, that doesn't have one. And at the moment, wh what you have is a kind of patchwork in which some states are much more stricter than others. And it becomes very messy and very complicated, um, very inefficient and very unfair because it means that somebody in one state um, may be more, much more exploited than somebody in a, in a different state. And this, well, and what should the privacy law look like? If you're interested in my book, I offer dozens of suggestions about what governments should do, what policymakers should do. And there's no magic wand. There's no, there's no one solution that is just gonna magically take care of everything in a second. But here are a few important things. One is we need to end the trade in personal data. It's just not worth it. The advantages that we get, we can get through other ways and the disadvantages are huge. Even in the most capitalist of societies, we agree that there are certain things that should be outside of the market. We don't sell people. We don't sell things like organs. We don't sell things like the results of sports matches. And importantly, we don't sell votes. Because if we sell votes, we don't have a democracy anymore. We have, we, we, we have something else and something that arguably we don't want because then the rich are going to decide the rules of society and it's going to be a kind of tyranny of the rich. So even in the most capitalist societies, we agree that there's certain things that should be outside of the market and personal data is one of those things, should be one of those things. For many of the same reasons uh, for why we don't allow the selling of votes because up until now, personal data has been used more or less like that, indirectly, but still with that kind of effect. Another very important thing is to have minimal cybersecurity standards. At the moment, companies don't have enough of an incentive to have good cybersecurity because users can't see it. If you compare an app that is really good in cybersecurity versus an app that is really bad, they look exactly the same. It's not like, you know, when you look at, at a door that is really robust, you have some sense of what it's supposed to look like. It doesn't work like that with tech. 
So because users don't see that, they, they, they're not willing to pay for that because everybody says that they can be trusted and users are kind of uh, not, not very willing to be trusting, especially after many, many scandals that we've seen. So why would they pay for that? Furthermore, when things go wrong, usually the worst of the brunt um, is bur it, the burden is, is, is in the users, on the users. So when people lose their personal data and they get extorted or, or they suffer identity theft, that's people suffering, not the company. So the only way in which companies will have good cybersecurity standards is if the government establishes certain minimal standards. And that's going to be good for everyone. It's going to be good for businesses because um, users are going to trust them a lot more. And also because they're going to protect their um, IP a lot better. At the moment, we have a serious problem of people around the world hacking companies and getting their, their, their corporate secrets out of them. And if we don't uh, up our cybersecurity standards, that's going to continue to happen. So we need to ban the trade in personal data. We need to have better cybersecurity standards. We need to ban personalized ads. Again, it's something that is uh, very dangerous because it gets used as personalized propaganda. The advantages we get are minimal and we can get them elsewhere. And the disadvantages are huge. So some people might argue, well, but I like seeing um, relevant ads and I do too. I don't enjoy seeing ads for, I don't know, a tractor or something that I'm never going to buy. But we don't need all that personal data to give you relevant ads. All we need is contextualized data. So if you search for a tractor, if that's what you're going to buy, then you'll see ads for a tractor. And if you search for shoes, then you'll see ads for shoes. And we don't need to know your sexual tendencies, your political preferences, um, how much you weigh, and all these very, very sensitive information that at the moment we, we are sending out. The way personalized ads work um, is through something called real-time bidding. So the way it works is you go into a website, and before the website even launches, um, your personal data is being sent to hundreds of companies that are bidding against each other to show you their ads. And this personal data is very sensitive. It's not just like your name and where you live, that too, but it does include things like sexual orientation, political tendencies, um, purchasing power, um, diseases, things about uh, health and education, and it's very, very thick. And then these companies assess that data very quickly, and the one that wants to show you an ad um, most wins the bid, and then you get to see that ad. So if you search for shoes yesterday on a particular website, and that website um, recognizes that you're there, and that you, they have a higher chance of selling you those shoes, they might be willing to pay more. But by that moment, you haven't even consented, by the way. And your personal data is already in the hands of hundreds of corporations that keep that personal data. And not only do they keep it, but then they sell it on to, to data brokers. And you might think, well, you know, data brokers, they're not so bad. Um, we kind of rely on them for things like um, researching credit and that kinds of, kinds of things. But when you look at even just the categories that data brokers use to then sell on these, these data lists um, to whoever wants to buy them, you get a sense of how murky it is and how questionable it is. So these categories include things like people who suffer from impotence, people who have HIV, people who have lost a child, people who have been the victims of rape. Um, these companies are really looking for where we hurt the most. And arguably, we shouldn't allow companies to profit from that, among other reasons, because it's toxic for society. Um, another measure that we should have is that we should insert forgetfulness into the digital. For most of history, forgetting has been a very useful tool. And we forgot in, in all kinds of ways. Of course, our memories are not perfect, so you learn things and you forget them. But also, even when we started recording things, recording was very, very expensive. It took time and effort. And when we first developed paper, it was a precious material. That's why we, we wrote without any spaces between words and from margin to margin. And when, for instance, paper didn't have acid, it used to crumble in a few years, or there were floods, there were fires, 
there were many mechanisms to forget in society. And they played an important role of related to forgiving, but also related to progress, to kind of letting go of the past and being able to look at the future with fresh eyes or the present with fresh eyes. The people who, who remember too much, you might think, you know, it, it's tempting to think I would like that you, know, you would like to remember more. It's kind of painful to forget things that, that, you, that you don't want to let go of. But actually the people who have extraordinary memories are typically people who are very, very burdened by that memory. And that memory doesn't allow them to really engage with the present in a way that allows them to, to progress. And societies that don't forget become extremely, extremely harsh. And the economics of forgetting and, and remembering have completely turned around. So today it's cheaper and easier to remember it all than to select things to forget. And we should change that because it's just too dangerous to have so much personal data. One way to do it is we could, we could just design files to auto-destruct in say a year or two or however many years, depending on the context. Um, we could uh, periodically delete certain kinds of data that are inaccurate. A lot of, or part of the reason why some algorithms are, are very bad at what they do is because they have data that is not accurate enough. Personal data has a, a very short expiry date. Many times pe people change, uh, people move houses, they move jobs, and we still use personal data that is, that is old on them. Um, and, and there are a few other measures, but perhaps the last one I, I mentioned, the last kind of big one, is we should consider using fiduciary duties when it comes to personal data. Fiduciary duties are duties that are relevant in professional relationships in which there's a huge asymmetry between the professional and the client. Examples include um, doctors and patients, lawyers and clients, and financial advisors and clients. And in all these relationships, you can imagine conflicts of interest. So you could imagine your doctor wanting to perform a surgery on you because they want to practice their skills, or they want to earn a bit more money that, that month, or they want an extra data point for their research, and they can't do that. The only reason they can perform surgery on you if it's, is if it's going to be in your benefit. And in the same way, um, personal data is something very sensitive, just like we give our bodies to the doctor, we give our financial affairs to our financial advisor and our legal case to our lawyer. When we give personal data to somebody, we are putting a lot of trust in that, in, in that person and if that person wants to have that job, if they want to manage or collect personal data, then they have to accept a responsibility of care that comes with a job. Just like it's not enough for a doctor to enjoy using a knife on people, they have to accept that there's a responsibility towards patients in the same way. People who want to deal with personal data should accept a responsibility so that that data only gets used for the benefit of the data subjects and never against them. So that, that's one thing that I, I said that there were two major things, uh, major roles that, that the US can play. The first one is to have the right US privacy law, federal law. And perhaps a, a, a minimalistic take would be to have an opt-in system. Right now, what we're seeing with the GDPR is, an, is that an opt-out system just doesn't work. It's completely irrational to ask people to opt out of cookies every time they visit a website, it just doesn't work. And it's too much of a burden on, on, on individuals. If it was the other way around in which you have to effortfully opt in to have your data collected, then that web page has a legitimate reason to remember you and they wouldn't have to burden you every time. And the people who don't want their data collected wouldn't have to do anything every time they go into a website. Okay, so that's the, the federal privacy law. The second thing that is going to be crucial in, in these times is better diplomacy. We really need a kind of new declaration of human rights for the digital age. And it's a, it's a time to come together again as democratic countries and have a, an alliance between the US and Europe in particular. But there are other countries that, that are also important, including Australia and New Zealand and Japan and some countries in Latin America, et cetera, because these tech companies are international and that creates certain kind of challenges, but it, it also creates an opportunity. When the US had to regulate Rockefeller, they were all alone. But today there are many countries that want to regulate big tech. And it's important to come to agreements with, when it comes to data, because at the moment, personal data is really the bedrock of trade. And if we have disagreements about that, they can jeopardize 
um, other aspects of our relationship. So there are three important um, kind of bullet points in the, on the agenda for international diplomacy and for democratic countries to come together. The first is privacy. The second one is cybersecurity and, and cybersecurity standards. And the third one is how do we regulate AI? And of course, these are big players in a, in a kind of big setting, but we all have a role to play, whether it's because we're citizens, whether it's because we're customers or users, whether it's because we work at a company or whether we work for the government. And to illustrate the power that one person can have, let me tell you a story, going back to the Second World War like we started. When the Nazis came to Fran uh, France and they realized they didn't have the data that they needed to get to the Jews. And there was a general comptoir in the army called René Carnil, who had Hollerith machines. These were punch card machines uh, developed by IBM that were used by the Nazis to keep control on people. And the French government didn't have these, but this guy was a fan of tech uh, back then, and he had them. So he volunteered to do a census to give the Nazis the data that they needed to find the Jews. Months passed, and there was no data. More months passed, and René Carmi didn't give the data to the Nazis. The Nazis grew impatient, and they started raiding, people, raiding homes, and, uh, but th they didn't have much to go on. So they depended on, on people either turning themselves in or neighbors turning them in. And it was incredibly inefficient. And the truth is that René Carmi had never planned to give that data to the Nazis. He was one of the highest uh, persons placed in, in the French resistance. And he did that census and he didn't collect the data about whether people were Jewish or not. And in that one act of one person deciding not to collect personal data, he saved hundreds of thousands of people. So I hope that can inspire us to think about what role we're playing in this data economy and, and how it can affect um, not only how our society works and our democracy, but also world politics. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions. Thank you, Carissa. That was that was very thoughtful, insightful, and, and we appreciate you sharing those remarks with us. Uh, we'll now transition to the uh, Q&A section, and uh, we'll walk through these questions uh, that are coming in from the audience um, you know, and, and, and just kind of follow up on your work. So you know, question number one. Uh, you know, part of what helps your work resonate with, with uh, kind of readers and, and those who digest it is that the points are made from a practical and, and ethical perspective. And one of these points in regards to, to ethics is that privacy is collective as it is personal. Can you touch on that viewpoint uh, for the audience, please? Yeah, one of the most damaging myths about privacy is that it's something individual and kind of a preference. And I argue that, yes, it's something personal, and it's, it's kind of intuitive to think about it as personal because personal data relates to the individual. But actually, privacy is important, first and foremost, because it's a collective endeavor. So it's collective in two ways. First, every time you share your data, the likelihood of sharing somebody else's data at the same time is very, very high. It's rare that you, can, you get to share your data without impacting anyone else. So for example, if you do one of these DNA tests um, from a company, and you give them your, your genetic data, you are giving them the data of your parents, of your siblings, of your children, of your cousins, and very distant kin whom you've never heard about, but who might be denied life insurance in the future, or who might even be deported. And this is not hypothetical, this has happened in Canada. In the same way, whenever you share data about your location, you're sharing data about your neighbors and your coworkers. And privacy is also collective because we suffer the consequences of the losses of privacy collectively. So only 270,000 people gave their data to Cambridge Analytica willingly. They probably didn't know how it was gonna be used, but they received a dollar for, for it, um, for giving the, the data. And with that data, the firm could access data of 87 million people who didn't consent and had no idea. And with that data, the, the firm managed to create a tool to profile voters around the world. So it affected millions of people and many democracies. And here, maybe it's, it's relevant to talk about whether personal data is a kind of property or not, because this is a very common thing and it's very kind of sexy to argue that people should be compensated for, for their personal data. There are a few reasons why your personal data is not 
like a house or a property. One reason is that you don't have the moral authority to sell that data when that data contains data about other people and when that data is going to affect other people. So if, if, you, if you own a house, you have the moral authority to do whatever you want with it, including destroying it if, if that's what you want or selling it. But it's not the same thing with personal data. But another reason is we would get very, very little for our personal data. We, we would get, I mean, um, estimates vary, but something like $18 a year or something like that. And there's nothing you can do with your personal data. An individual doesn't know how to use, say, your music taste for anything. Whereas if you, if you give them to a company and they have billions of data points uh, on billions of people, um, then they have a kind of power that really distorts democracy because it's, it's, it's too asymmetrical in a way that if we give it to individuals and individuals get compensated, that asymmetry doesn't get rectified. So those are two reasons, but there are more for, for why personal data is kind of collective and not kind of individual property. Yeah, that, that alarming is, is, is quite alarming that when you put a dollar amount on the benefit of that personal data, it gets very interesting. You know, uh, you used a term earlier, toxic data. Um, you know, one of the earlier speakers, keynote speaker, Frank Abingdale, also touched on the fact that ultimately with the advent of technology and the data, someone will find a way to misappropriate uh, private data or personal data um, you know, with malintent. And so do, do you subscribe to that thought process? Absolutely. It's kind of sad, but it's just in the nature of personal data. It's so sensitive that sooner or later, it's going to end up in the worst possible hands. And one example is how now there are a lot of concerns about the biometric data of Afghans who helped Americans um, and whether that biometric data is going to be accessible to Taliban's. And when we collect personal data, many times we're, we're very optimistic. We think like, oh, we'll use it for good. And we imagine it ending up in the, in the best possible hands. But actually what we should imagine it is ending up in the worst possible hands because that's likely what will happen sooner or later if we don't delete it in time. Got it. So, you know, we can dig a little bit deeper on DNA. So, you know, clearly the benefit of finding perpetrators of a crime, uh, you know, that has helped to not just find criminals, but also release folks that have been, uh, you know, imprisoned uh, unjustly. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a very big benefit of, of having this personal uh, data in, in regards to DNA. Does that outweigh or is that not significant enough to offset the collective cost to society of this DNA being broadly distributed to its holders? Well, first, let's talk more about the benefit. I mean, that benefit sounds very good, especially if we imagine like, the, the worst possible criminals, right? Nobody wants serial killers running around and DNA can help find these people. However, um, I think, again, we're much, much more optimistic about DNA than it's, than it's warranted. The analysis of DNA is actually very subjective. Basically, you have somebody in a lab code that is looking at two images and kind of trying to figure out whether they look alike enough, basically. And there have been many cases in which people have been falsely accused based on a DNA test. And this kind of optimism has been very corrosive because instead of the police researching more and then having DNA as a kind of extra reason to think that somebody is, is guilty, sometimes they start with the DNA and they have no reason to think somebody is guilty except for the DNA. And that has ended up in false accusations. So we should be careful about um, assessing well exactly what the benefit is. But then even if it was a benefit, let's say it was kind of 100% um, certain that, and no mistakes were made, like, are we willing to pay the price for the risk of undermining our democracy. Because a police state can also be very safe, but is that what we want? Got it. No, that, and that makes sense. Uh, there's, there's clearly a trade-off there. Um, I was kind of segueing on to other risks. Uh, some of your works have drawn parallels between environmental factors uh, and, and, and also the, the risk around misappropriation of personal data you know, for, for corporations. Can, can you expand on that comparison for us, please? Sure. Um, there are quite a, quite a bit of similarities. So one similarity is that um, privacy has this kind of cumulative effect. So with ecology, if you like throw something, some, some trash on the street, you won't see like climate change suddenly happen and, and, and kind of descend upon you in, in 10 minutes, right? It's the accumulation of pollution and, and different kinds of uh, pollutants that create different kinds of effects. And the same thing with, with privacy. It's very easy to just give your name to a store and give your date of birth to this other pe person and then give your address to this other store. And it seems like 
everything's fine because you don't feel anything, nothing bad happened. But then one year down the line or two years down the line, um, you ask for a, job, for a job or a loan or an apartment and it gets denied. And um, it might be because you gave those, those data points a while back. And also we have to think about how data gets aggregated. So to you, it might mean nothing um, to share your, say your musical taste. But when companies aggregate data and then analyze it and find correlations, um, they might get things like your sexual orientation from your musical taste. And while you might be happy to share your music taste, you might not want to share your, your sexual orientation, but you're not realizing that you're, that you're doing that. So that's, that's one way in which it's, it's similar. And the other way in which it's similar is the collective aspect. Um, you might be somebody who is extremely careful, doesn't take a flight, recycles everything. It's kind of the perfect um, e ecological citizen. But if the people around you are not, you are still going to suffer the effects of climate change, just like everyone else. And the same with privacy. You can be very careful, but if your friends, family, citizens around you um, are not careful, we can still suffer, suffer very bad consequences. And let's talk about the risk from a business model standpoint. Um, you know, a lot of what we do when we analyze companies is we consider ESG risk factors, environmental, social governance. And so do you, do you think that the way ha companies handle data should be considered in regards to the governance component? Um, you know, is there a risk similar to having a strong carbon footprint uh, that, that you would draw a parallel? Absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, because say a company has a lot of personal data and that personal data gets hacked by China and it gets used to try to uh, identify who can be recruited as a spy or it gets used to try to um, send personalized propaganda to people to discourage them from voting or things like that. That's having a cost on society that is extremely high. And it's not clear that the company has um, the authority to do that when it has cost to society. So I think that that's a good parallel. I think I think I looked at one of your uh, other writings and it mentioned, uh, you know, something similar to uh, you know, personal data. It can be considered the new oil. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's an interesting parallel. And I appreciate you expanding on that for us. So let's let's switch a little bit to national security. Um, you, you touched on earlier in your talk about how easy it was to find the location of the president, the U.S. president. Uh, how serious of a risk do you consider things like uh, location data or facial recognition that can be collected without us uh, being aware of it? Uh, is that a risk, personally, in your opinion, to um, you know both individuals and, and and countries? Definitely, it's a risk because. More likely than not, you have already been subjected to some kind of algorithm that used that data and the algorithm was probably not very accurate. Why? Because we have algorithms everywhere and because they have no supervision and because they have been shown to be quite inaccurate every time we kind of look at one. So um, the thing is, you, you may have been a victim of an injustice and you will never know about it because when you ask for a loan and you don't get it, you don't get an explanation. Or you ask for a job and say there are two equally qualified candidates, but the prospective employer has the files from the data brokers on, on both of them. And it turns out that one has certain kind of genes that might be correlated to having cancer early on in life. Or it, it looks like um, they have, a, I don't know, a, a hobby that, 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 that the employer hates or, or something like that. And they choose the other candidate for reasons that shouldn't be. How are you going to know about that? It's, it's kind of impossible to police that kind of discrimination. So unless we make sure that you never have access to that data, we won't know. And with regards to facial recognition, it's extremely dangerous because let's say that you lose your password. You can change your password. You can change your face. So one of the things I worry, for example, is um, airports. Many airports are um, managed by corporations and, and it's corporations that are uh, collecting this data and in some cases governments have uh, have been asked like who exactly is the corporation how, how are they using that data and the government wasn't able to answer that question so what i worry is if there's like a massive leak of biometric data like fingerprints and and facial prints um those people are going to be vulnerable for the rest of their lives because they can't change those things got it you touched on um you know location data for for jobs and employment um, you know, and, and that makes sense. So, you know, if, if, if I were to personally visit a mental health facility, um, you know, periodically or routinely, that could show up on my location data for someone tracking it, and that could then uh, be pulled in by an employer should they choose to use that to screen out a candidate. 
What about from a national security standpoint? Uh, you know, things like military bases or, or secret locations. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, there, we have already had some bad experiences there. So one famous experience was uh, Strava. This is an app that um, tracks people's running. And uh, in this case, they published a heat map of uh, runners. And for months, nobody noticed anything. But then one person looked into it, and they realized that you could infer secret US bases, military bases from that data, because you could see that there were people running around areas in which there was nothing around it. Um, so if you correlated that with the Google Maps and then you saw a blurred space, then, then you could tell that, that, that it was a, a military base. Now Strava has changed that. And we have had all other, other kinds of inklings that that is um, a worry. So in some cases, there has been uh, US intrusion or, or intervention uh, asking a social media company to sell um, their, the, the part that is relevant to the US to a US company because they didn't want that, that country to have that personal data. And some people were asking, well, why, why would that be? And the US didn't answer with an official response. But one hypothesis is that when you get that kind of personal data, you get very per sensitive data like HIV status or sexual orientation and sensitive things like that. And if you have that sensitive data on public officials or people in the military, it would be very, very easy to blackmail them. Furthermore, if you think about a country like China, they have cutting edge AI, but most of their data, presumably, comes from Chinese people. So they don't know whether the algorithms work on Western people. So they want to access our data to make sure that their algorithms also work on us. And that could be used for all kinds of things, all kinds of inferences and all kinds of intelligence. And in the event of a conflict, a military conflict that you know, let's hope never happens, but could happen, um, we would be quite vulnerable. Got it. No, that's that's interesting. Uh, that, that that makes a lot of sense. That's a serious risk there for sure. Um, you know, let, let's go back to the, the quantification of this data, putting a price on it. You know, the the data brokers. Um, how profitable is their business model? Well, it's incredibly profitable um, because everybody wants this data. Insurance companies, banks, prospective employers, governments, um, even city planners. Everybody's buying this data, so they're incredibly um, profitable. And something that's interesting is sometimes there are worries about the economy, right? What, what will happen if we, if we actually end the, the, the data trade or the trading personal data? And, and there are two reflections on that that I think are relevant, um, not directly answering your question, but kind of uh, related. One is that a big company like a data broker doesn't have the kind of employees that big companies of the past had before. So say, you know, a car company has hundreds of thousands of employees. And in that way, it provides a very important service to the community. But a data broker has a few dozen thousand, maybe, or one or, or a dozen thousand. And, and that's a very different impact. So it, it actually contributes to inequality. Another concern that I didn't mention, but is very important, is that it turns out that the people who created the market for personalized ads which is the kind of essence of the collection of personal data online, are the same people who created the market uh, of subprime mortgages that created the financial crisis in 2008. And the concern is that these personalized ads are not as effective as people think. They're a little bit effective in selling ads, but they're so much more expensive that they're not worth it. So whereas they can be sufficiently um, efficient or impactful to sway an election because some elections are lost or won for a few thousand by a few thousand votes. And it's not worth it in the commercial side because they're so expensive. And the worry is that when publishers of ads realize that they've been paying for something that is not worth it, the bubble will burst and we'll find ourselves in, in a crisis. So that's yet another reason to look into regulating this fear. So that, that makes sense. So, I mean, in a nutshell, the the, the value of this data is very low, which is why um, you know, the data brokers can acquire it so cheaply and then use it in various ways uh, in, in mass and, and generate you know, revenue streams that way. So it's a very profitable business model for them, but the actual value of the data itself and the cost to acquire it is low. And, and so you know, we put that side by side with the point of whether or not individuals should, you know, should they choose to opt in and share their personal data, should they get compensated for that? Um, 
you know, the view, viewpoint there is probably that the compensation would be extremely low to the tune of $18, as you touched on earlier. Yeah, something so, like that. I forget, I forget the exact number, but it's something that's not going to matter in your life. And right. you, will, you, you will pay a high price for it in other areas of life. So, so in, 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 in a way, you're, you're actually not being compensated. But what you were saying uh, is really important. Like data has a really bad combination, personal data, because it's cheap and valuable and sensitive. And that's a terrible combination to have. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, and, and the collective aspect of, you know, whether I collect my 18 or $20 for opting in and selling my personal data, the collective cost of that is, is tremendous. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, let's, let's touch on regulation. You mentioned that, you know, the path forward here uh, requires regulation. So how critical is, is regulation as a part of the ultimate solution? And are you optimistic that initiatives like the National Alliance, you know, the GDPR initiatives, and so forth will help pull the US out of uh, its current state of gridlock uh, in terms of policy in this area. And you know, additionally, you know, is it enough to just focus on the collection of data? So I'm optimistic in the long run. Um, the landscape is pretty grim at the moment, um, but I think it's so grim that it's kind of unsustainable. So what I see are two paths forward. Either we realize how reckless we're being and we regulate in time, and you know, a lot of people are cynics about this and say, well, that's impossible. But actually something like the GDPR a few years ago was thought to be absolutely impossible. And for all its faults, it has changed the debate worldwide. But also we've regulated things like um, CFCs. So a few years ago, not too long ago, um, we were destroying the ozone layer. We realized this, we regulated CFCs and today it's recovering and it will fully recover in a few years. So we can do this. What I worry about is that we don't do it in time, on time, and then we, we, have, we wait until something goes massively wrong. Either um, something like data being used for the purposes of genocide in the West, because if it, if it happens outside of the West, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like that's gonna change anything, um, or some kind of real national security threat that, that is very credible and imminent, and then we'll regulate. But, but this state of the wild West is unsustainable. Got it. No, that makes sense. We're at a point where something has to happen. Yeah, um, something's going to give. Well, let's start with the grassroots approach. What are some practical steps we can take as individuals to protect our data and, and advocate for change? Yeah, that's really important because on the one hand, we need regulation and there's no way around that. But what we do as individuals will matter a lot for whether we get regulation, when we get it, and how, what kind of regulation we get. Um, so it, it sends a message to policymakers that we care, and it sends a message to businesses that they can um, use privacy as a competitive advantage. So the things that we can do is protect other people's privacy. So don't go around retweeting or, re or forwarding messages that clearly violate somebody's privacy. Um, don't take pictures of people and upload them without their, concern, their, their consent, or don't cite people um, in a private conversation. Uh, don't cite them in, a, in, a, in the public sphere. Um, choose privacy-friendly apps and platforms. There are many alternatives out there. They're easy to find, uh, but like Signal is very good. There are others. Uh, contact your political representatives and tell them that you worry about privacy and ask them what they're doing to, to protect your privacy. Um, ask companies to delete your data. Contact them, say that you want your data and tell them to delete your data. And even if you fail, what, what is most important is that you do that because Two years down the line, when a regulator looks at that and the company says, yeah, we did these terrible things, but it's fine because users were happy to give us our data and you give them evidence, you, you create a paper trail uh, of how you were trying to resist, that's going to be very significant. So just try to resist as best you can. You don't have to be perfect. You will fail many times, that's okay, but it's still meaningful. And we don't need 100% of people being perfect to change things. We only need five to 10% of people meaningfully resisting it to make a huge difference. That's, that's great. And, and that paper trail makes sense, just having that on the record. Um, well, thank you, Carissa. This is, uh, you know, we're approaching the end of our session. Um, you know, on behalf of William Blair and the members of this audience, we appreciate your time and, and the insight you've shared with us today and, and these practical next steps that we can take as individuals. Um, you know, it's been my pleasure to host you as moderator. Uh, and, and, you know, we just truly appreciate you being here. You know, to the audience, you know, thank you for participating in this breakout session. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, if there were any questions we did not get to, please feel free to reach out to your William Blair contact, and we will be happy to try to follow up.
Um, you know, this is uh, the, the last uh, session of uh, the Connectivity 2021 virtual conference on cybersecurity, privacy, and politics for the day. Uh, as a reminder, the next event will take place on November 16th. Invitations will be sent out at a future date, so please keep an eye out for them. Uh, or reach out to your William Miller contact for uh, more information. Carissa, thank you again. This has truly been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. All right. That concludes our session, everyone.